And for me, I wanted to touch upon uh, substance use and addiction, which is a topic that unfortunately we don't talk very often about in Masajid. Uh, and when we do talk about it, it's usually just, hey, this stuff is haram. All right, guys, it's all clear. Thank you for coming. You know, you can see yourselves out. Um, and that's not much of a conversation. Uh, everything we're going to be talking about today, all these substances, the mutual consensus that we have as a community is that you should not be partaking in these substances. It's obvious, but I'm here to talk about what isn't obvious. And what isn't obvious is that just because something is deemed impermissible in the Muslim community does not give us leeway to brush it under the rug and pretend that it doesn't happen to us as Muslims and that our community doesn't have to deal with something like this when the truth is um, this is a serious problem in our Muslim community, particularly in New York as you've had quite a number of janazas recently, especially during the pandemic, related to um, overdoses and suicide, sometimes even accidental suicide where someone did not intend to die, but consumed more than whatever they could handle of a particular substance and then wound up taking their life uh, as a result. So uh, what I'm going to focus on today, um, I'll be brief, I don't want to hit you guys too much with too much information, but uh, I'm going to give you a brief crash course uh, on addiction. Basically, just teach you the ABCs, the one, two, threes of what exactly is addiction, how does addiction work, uh, what are the different substances, and I'm only going to touch upon a few major ones, and then what are the treatment options available uh, for certain substances and addictions uh, for us. So uh, we start first and foremost with, it's not shown, but we start first and foremost with, oh no, here we go. This should be good, right? Um, is it present? It's not present. <gasps> oh my God. It's not working. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no worries. You do your thing. Oh, oh beautiful. Thank you. Jazak l'chir. Awesome. We're good. So, we start with what is addiction? What exactly is this? Uh, and honestly speaking, addiction, I know we tend to associate this with drugs. That's what people tend to think go hand in hand. Addiction is anything. You could be addicted to literally anything. Any human behavior that can be consumed is something that can be ripe for addiction. Some addictions are very, very common. Some addictions, not so common. Doesn't mean that just because they're rare, we're not susceptible to it. But an important thing to recognize is whatever makes someone obsessively and compulsively use whatever the use may be the thing if you have lost control of your ability to resist the urges to use something we consider this to be within the realm of an addiction so addictions are characterized by four things so if you look at these four bullet points here uh tolerance withdrawal physical cravings and emotional obsession and we'll touch upon each one the first one being tolerance which is the more and more and more you do something, the less and less, less effect it has on you. So you do more of it to get the same effect as the first time. So I'll use uh, food as an example. So if I'm the kind of guy who I love chicken tikka masala, it's my jam, and you give me a small portion of it, you know those plates that are like already like divided? They have like a one big roti divider and then they have the two smaller divider thingies. You see them all the time. Um, so if you give me just enough to fill just one little section of my plate and that's all you give me and it's the most amazing chicken tikka masala I've had in my life. It's Eid in my mouth. That's how amazing it tastes. Obviously what I want is I want more and you can't just give me the same amount. I want a little more of it. So fill the other section of it. Now you're doubling up on it. But now it doesn't taste the same way that it did before because when you have too much of something, it doesn't taste as good as the first time. So maybe just a little bit more might be a little bit better. Now, instead of just having two chicken tikka masalas, I'm adding in garlic naan on top of that. Now the garlic naan isn't really good enough. I want kima naan on top of that. And now all of a sudden, what became a small thing has over time gotten out of control where now every single event that I go to, it doesn't matter where it is, I will look for chicken tikka masala, and if I cannot find it, I will punch every person in the face until someone gets it for me, and I get my fix. And if I do not get my fix, 
I am an emotional wreck as a result. I cannot function until I get what I need. This is no longer about food anymore. Now you've seen it's something different. It's transformed me as a person. My behavior has changed around the thing that I liked. So this is no longer Omar likes chicken tikka masala. This is now Omar has lost control of himself when it comes to chicken tikka masala. Do you see how it's no longer about the substance anymore? You can replace the substance with anything. Take chicken tikka masala, remove it, and put heroin in its place. Same concept. Same exact concept. Only one of them is super, super haram, and the other one's totally permissible. But I think for a Muslim community, if something is permissible, that just means that we abuse it without anyone calling us out on it. And that makes it a little bit more tricky to deal with than something outright. Um, so that would be tolerance. Withdrawal would be if I don't have it, my body physically reacts to not having it. I experience symptoms when I don't have something. Every single person knows what I'm talking about when the first day of Ramadan hits and you don't have coffee. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If anyone here regularly drinks coffee, this is your jam. The first day of Ramadan is the worst day of Ramadan because your body goes into caffeine withdrawal. Whenever your body is experiencing symptoms when you don't have something, that is considered an addiction. So if you're having severe withdrawals in the beginning of Ramadan, you probably have to sit down and think about how much caffeine you're consuming and what it's doing to you. Uh, next up is physical cravings. If I don't have it, I'm constantly thinking about it and I can't stop myself from thinking about it. It's almost like an intrusive thought inside my mind. And the last one is emotional obsession. Nothing else matters to me more than what I want. And I want that chicken tikka masala. And I can't think of anything else. You can put the most amazing food in front of me, but I don't care. That's not what I want. I want just one thing. It's like a singular focus that you, that you laser in on. Um, so this is super important. And I really want to emphasize this, especially when we're talking about ourselves as Muslims, which is that addiction is an illness. Addiction is a disease. The problem that we have in the Muslim community is that we don't see it as a disease or an illness. We see it as this one particular brother or sister has failed to control themselves. Therefore, it's their own fault. No one's opening their mouth and shoving something inside it. No one's putting a gun to their head and telling them to use something. They are choosing each time to use this. And no matter how many times you give them the siha, they continue to use it anyway. Therefore, that Muslim has failed, failed themselves, failed the family, failed the community, failed their deen. Therefore, that Muslim is an utter failure. It's their own decision. And if this Muslim destroys their family or destroys themselves, they brought it on themselves. It's a cruel way to think because you wouldn't treat any other sickness or illness the same way. If I had a brother come to the masjid and that brother fell and fractured his leg and he's limping, you wouldn't point at that brother and say, oh my God, did you miss Fajr last week? Is this why? Stuff, well, how dare you? You're not allowed here anymore. You reek. You reek of like bandages and you reek of like uh, uh, oils on you. Get out. We don't want you to like come to the masjid and soil the presence of our community by looking this way here. Yet, if I remove the broken leg of that brother and I made him intoxicated instead, what would your reaction be to that same brother now? Would you want him there? And the answer is, and you can be honest as a community, and the honest answer is no. No, you would not. You wouldn't want him praying next to you because you could smell him. You wouldn't want him stumbling into the masjid. You wouldn't want him anywhere near kids. You wouldn't want him anywhere near your family. You wouldn't want him anywhere near the premises. You would want him removed. And you'd get security to escort him out because he's intoxicated. You don't know what he's going to do or what he's going to say or what he has on him. Therefore, there's an incredibly strong stigma against addiction, particularly against substance use uh, in our community. This is a brain disease. This is a mental illness. And my specialty in medicine is psychiatry. My specialty is treating mental illness, and I treat addiction. I don't judge addiction, I treat addiction. And this is an important concept that I want everyone here to understand. That in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created physical illness, Allah has also created psychological distress and trauma and has also created mental illness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every single illness and dysfunction known to man or even unknown to man. And there is a cure and a treatment for every single condition except for one. And the only treatment that does not exist is the treatment for death. That's it. Which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created addiction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the mechanisms in our mind to become addicted. And in so creating this, Allah has also created treatment 
for it. So treat this in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it. In that all these illnesses have been created by him. All of these illnesses are an affliction, a trial. And different Muslims struggle with different trials. Some Muslims, this is their trial. So treat it as a trial. That the Muslim who suffers from addiction is struggling. They're fighting something. So support the fight. Don't point your finger at them and say, Haram, I can't believe you're doing this. Your Muslim brother and sister is fighting. It's your job as their community member, as their Ummah, to support them in that battle rather than ostracize them for it. Um, so there are some common addictions here that I have up here. We got on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got the common ones that everyone knows of, alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, uh, prescription medications, methamphetamine, uh, hallucinogens. There's a bunch more but just, just the basic rundown of drugs. And on that side, these are the ones that are not well known, but are just as addictive. And that would be food, pornography, uh, exercise, love, internet, video games. I mean, there's so many more. I can put gambling up there also. Any behavior that consumes you and overrides your ability to control yourself is an addiction. So that like uh, list over there could be endless with whatever it is that you could be struggling with. So, what are the actual criteria for someone having an addiction? What does it mean when I say you have an addiction? There are a few key symptoms here to keep in mind. The first is you have cravings for it, wanting to cut down. You want to stop. You know in your heart there's a fitra in you telling you this feels wrong, but you can't control yourself. It's almost like it's overriding you, and it's controlling you. Uh, taking the substance in larger amounts or longer than you're meant to, this is something that's very key because a lot of Muslims feel, well, I'm not addicted to anything. And I would point out and say, well, are you popping three or four Tylenols or ibuprofens to handle your headache? If you're taking more than the recommended amount of something and you do this very frequently, you are at very high risk for abusing something and then developing an addiction. It can happen to anyone. So don't presume that just because you don't have anything, Brother Sharif is talking about other people. He's not talking about me. The thing is that all of us are at risk. For developing this. That's why it's important, and this is the, one of the most beautiful parts of our sunnah, which is not one or two things in moderation, everything in moderation. It's beautiful where the sunnah comes from, where it's almost predictive that we are, as human beings, weak toward this. And it's important to self-regulate when that happens. Next up is neglecting other parts of your life because of your substance use. So this is neglect of family, neglect of friends, neglect of job, neglect of duties, neglect of school, neglect of whatever it is. You're supposed to be doing. You choose the substance use and pursuing the substance over the things that are most important in your life. And as a result, these things deteriorate in your life. And oftentimes it leads to disastrous consequences. Could lead to divorce, could lead to family dysfunction, could lead to family kicking you out, could lead to loss of home, loss of job. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can happen from uncontrolled addiction. And then um, next one, continue to use. Even when it causes all these problems and you know it's causing problems, you still do it anyway. And then the final one, using substances even when it puts you in danger, when you know it's too much, when you know it's hurting you, when you know it's terrible, you do it anyway. So from here, this is something I really want to emphasize for this presentation. What you have up here is a bunch of stuff on the screen. I know it looks like a bunch of goggle gook, but uh, the most important thing to figure here is that every single one of us is a circle. Every single one of us is a circle. And Allah SWT has created us all different shapes and sizes for our circle. Some of our circles are imperfect. Some of our circles have a dent in it. Some of our circles have cracks. Some of our circles are not even circles. They're like an ellipse. Some of us don't even have circles. Some of us are squares. Allah SWT creates us in all different ways. The point is, every single person's circle is comprised of four different sections. The first one is going to be biological or physical. This pertains to your physical body. Second is psychological, your mental health. Third is social, the interactions you have with people around you. And then the last one is spiritual, and that concerns only one relationship, and that's your relationship between you and Allah. So when it comes to addiction, this is the important thing to recognize, that addiction can come from any one of these parts of our circle. So first and foremost is going to be the biological or the physical part of it. I'm going to give you a breakdown of what this actually looks like inside the human brain. Second is going to be the psychological component of what addiction means to someone's mood and their emotions and the psychology of addiction. Third is going to be the social aspect of it, which is if you're around people who consume a lot or consume excessively, or they themselves have an addiction, you are far more likely to mirror that behavior, far more likely to mirror that behavior. That's why the people you surround yourself with, it's absolutely critical 
that if they are also using, it will enable your use. And if you're not using and you're sober, being around people who are constantly using will make it that much more difficult for you. There's a much higher risk of you relapsing. So oftentimes, whenever uh, you have a brother or sister who's struggling with addiction, the most important thing is keeping them in a circle, a community circle or a social circle or family circle that is supportive and uplifting of their struggle and doesn't enable them uh, with it. And then the last person one is going to be spiritually. Spiritually, this is very important in that Oftentimes, when someone's mind gets overrode with their addiction, they lose their connection with their dean. They lose their connection with their community. Oftentimes, when you have a brother or sister struggling with addiction, this is the last place on the planet they're going to show up. They're not coming to the masjid. They're not coming to Holocaust. They're not coming for Salah. They're not coming here. They're not. And that's something that we as a Muslim community have to recognize, that the Muslims who struggle the most are the ones who don't come here. And that's a problem that we have created in Ummah, we've created Masajid to be country clubs for the spiritually elite, rather than what this Masjid is supposed to be, which is a hospital for the spiritually sick. This is where people come for healing. This is where people come for Rahmah. This is the house of Allah. It is literally the house of Rahmah. This is where mercy should be. And yet for Muslims that struggle with addiction, they don't find mercy here. What they find is judgment. What they find is ostracizing. What they find is haram. What they find is your fault. What they find is get out. What they find is this is your fault. What they find is go make toba and then come back. This is what they find when they come here. That a lot of Muslim communities do not have programs set up for brothers and sisters who suffer from addiction. We don't talk about it, let alone even have halakas for it or programs for it. Therefore, they don't find it here. So the spiritual component suffers as a result of their addiction. Now, this is going to be super important. I really want to emphasize this next one, which is going to be, I know there's a lot of like doctor stuff up here. You could totally ignore this. It's just some whatever. You guys don't need to know. I'm not testing you on any of this stuff. Okay. But super important to note, which is whenever you do something that makes you feel good, there is a way that your brain nerves talk to each other. And the way they talk to each other is they use a certain chemical. Think of the chemical as like writing a love letter from one nerve to another nerve. And the nerve is saying, oh my God, something really amazing happened today and I want to share the vibe. And it sends a letter or it sends a text to the other nerve. The other nerve picks it up and says, oh my God, this is the funniest meme. This is so hilarious. I feel good too now. And now if enough nerves share the signal, you feel better. You feel good. The message, the signal that gets sent between these nerves is called dopamine. Dopamine is like the happy chemical. So uh, for example... If I told each and every one of you, look underneath your seats, there's a thousand dollar check written out to you from Islamic Circle of Long Island, and it's for you. This is like a reverse donation or something, like a reverse salaka. You guys would have your dopamine shoot up because it's an incredibly pleasurable thing to have. You just got a bunch of money. You came to an event for free and you walked out with a thousand dollars. That's crazy. Usually the opposite happens. You lose a thousand dollars when you show up to the motion. But if I were to tell you that, uh, oh, later tonight, I'm going to cook for you your favorite food, your number one favorite food, it's yours tonight. I'm going to have a butler bring it to you on a silver platter, open the platter up, and the smell is going to hit your nose, and oh my God, it feels amazing. It's like a star time all over again, only you're not fasting. This is what makes your dopamine level spike. It causes an increase in your pleasure chemical. So I'm going to show you guys two things. So here, I want you guys to pay attention to the numbers. Don't pay attention to like all the chart stuff. That's all other stuff you don't need to know about. Let's talk about food. So if you look at the dopamine spike from when someone eats, you go from a dopamine level of 100 and you go to 150. Keep the number in mind that eating food gives you a dopamine, a pleasure chemical level of about 150. Uh, the act of sex, engaging in intercourse, gives you a dopamine level of 200. So it's a pleasure level of 200. Keep this in mind, food and sex, which everyone here universally agrees is what gives us pleasure, has levels of 150 and 200. I'm going to hit the screen again. I want you to take a look at these levels here. We're going to look at meth first, then cocaine, then nicotine, and morphine. And if you look at the numbers here, look at the top number. That's what you want to look at. Cocaine gives you a pleasure level of about 350. Nicotine gives you a pleasure level of about 225. Morphine gives you a constant long-term pleasurable feeling that hits a high of about 200. And then if you look at methamphetamine, methamphetamine gives you pleasure levels in your brain of 1,000. 
which is insane when you look at these numbers, compared to just normal human food and sex. This is what these chemicals do to you. And so when your brain gets overloaded with this much pleasure, everything else in comparison, we go back to this now, this stuff doesn't feel good anymore because you felt better. So food doesn't really matter to you much. It doesn't give you the same kind of pleasure. Sex doesn't even really matter to you. It doesn't give you the same kind of pleasure. The regular things that you normally enjoy, you don't enjoy them as much anymore because you've achieved something that very few other people have achieved. Pleasure levels of a thousand or higher. What you're gonna go after is that same level of pleasure again. And that means returning back to this. And the important thing to note is that you only ever hit that level once. Take a look at the top. Do you see the top? Each peak, think of it as like a mountain. You see the top peak of the mountain? Where do your pleasure levels go once you've hit the peak? Straight down. And you notice it for every single substance here, it just gets lower and lower and lower each time, which means no matter how much you use, you will never achieve that first initial high, but you will continuously keep chasing it either way. And this is where the addiction begins to grow inside your brain. Your nerves now are used to talking to each other this way. You've almost like changed the way your brain functions now around this drug. And now this gobbledygook picture that I showed you before, this system of pleasure, pleasure chemicals in your brain is now overloaded. And now you have developed an addiction as a result. And the addiction is something where these chemicals now in your brain need the substance. They need it. You can't function without it. So now you're no longer in control. It's almost like physically speaking, Something else have, has overwritten your ability to control yourself. And what's been overwritten is this pathway inside your brain. This is why we treat addiction as a brain disease. This is what I mean when I talk about it's a mental illness, it's a brain illness. This is what I mean. You have damaged something inside the chemical pathway of your brain. It's damaged. And as a result, you are sick. You're sick. You're hurting and this requires treatment. Don't think of addiction as a personal choice. Well, that guy snorted meth, stuff for it's his fault. No, absolutely not. That person is struggling now to build their life back after having made a mistake. And every single person here has made a mistake. You would want the same mercy for yourself as you would want for any brother and sister who made the mistake and is now paying forward for that mistake. So, Moving on from here, I wanna talk more about the psychology of it. So this is, we're going from physical now to psychological. Psychologically speaking, there is a cycle of addiction that we get trapped in. So think of this as like a never ending loop that someone's in, where we, we start off with substance abuse. We'll start off right here, which is using a substance. We lose control over it. Then there's excessive guilt over the fact that you use this. You torture yourself over the fact that you've used something. You know that Allah is probably judging you, your community is judging you, your family is judging you, you don't feel like a good Muslim anymore, you don't feel like you belong here anymore, it's almost like imposter syndrome, you're a fake Muslim, you're masquerading and pretending to be a Muslim when deep down you know you made a mistake and you used something you shouldn't have used, and now it's out of control. Over this, you now, you tell yourself, I'm gonna stop. I will try my best to stop, but this is the point. You guys remember the first slide where I talked about craving? Where even when I don't have chicken tikka masala in front of me, it's almost like I'm obsessing over it. I can't think of anything else but it. So we begin to have cravings for that. And give it enough time, and eventually you become frustrated. You can't deal with the cravings anymore. Nothing else gives you the same pleasure anymore compared to that. You saw the numbers, you know what I'm talking about. Nothing's giving you the same pleasure. Therefore, you grow more and more irritable, more and more frustrated, more and more impatient with it. And eventually this leads to a relapse. You then begin fantasizing, obsessing, and this leads right back to substance abuse, and now the cycle all over again happens, over and over and over. Substance addiction is a chronic mental illness. It doesn't mean that I use a substance, get addicted, beat the addiction, and then alhamdulillah, everything's hunky-dory. For the rest of my life, I will struggle with this. This is my trial from Allah, that for the rest of my life, even when I'm 80 years old, I will still have a craving. I'll still have something tugging at me in my heart to want to relapse again and use again. And I have to fight against that. It's a daily battle to do that. Brothers and sisters who have gained their sobriety, it is an incredible accomplishment. It is, it's an incredible accomplishment. And it's very, very likely that if you have family members or friends who have achieved sobriety, it's a likelihood that they may relapse. 
They may make a mistake. They may fall back into old habits. Sometimes the brain chemicals are so, so strong, they can't resist it and they'll use again. And the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always asks that when you sin, it's not about the sin, it's about the repentance after the sin. And that you can continuously keep repenting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah will continue to forgive so long as you continue to repent. When you stop repenting, this is where the problem happens. The same thing happens for addiction. You can relapse over and over and over and over again. Your family members get so annoyed and frustrated with you that you just became sober and you're using again. What is your problem? You just got clean again and now again you're using. I can't believe you. This is it. I'm done with you. People will lose patience with you. The importance is that you need to have sabr working with this. This is a very, very difficult illness to treat and people will relapse over and over and over again. The point isn't the relapse. The point is getting back onto this circle and again, reaching the point where you stop using. You reach sobriety again. And you do it however many times you need to in your life to do this. I know it's not easy. This sounds so much easier than what I'm saying. When you have families that struggle with this, and I know Sister Salia can speak from experience on this, when families struggle with addiction, this rips families apart. It is not easy to deal with this. It's not easy for the person suffering, and it's not easy for the family members around them to deal with this. It's not easy for the community at large to acknowledge this and tackle this. So I'm just gonna touch really briefly, I'm gonna wrap up with this, which is what are the different types of substances? Um, this is like a really fancy, like big chart thing. I don't expect you guys to like hips this or anything. Uh, but we start up top with um, depressants. So depressants is anything that slows the brain down. And typical depressants are like alcohol, uh, benzodiazepines like Xanax, Valium, Ambi, these are sedatives. So anything that causes sedation would be a depressant. Alcohol is the most famous of all the depressants. Um, what you usually see is that you have a slowed reaction time, disorientation, depression, fatigue, you get drunk, uh, you become disoriented. Uh, next up are stimulants. Stimulants are the opposite of depressants. So stimulants are something that actually pep you up and give you a surge of energy. Methamphetamine, the one that gave you a pleasure level of 1,000, methamphetamine is a stimulant. Other types are nicotine, Adderall, cocaine, those are other types in addition to meth. These are going to speed up your brain, make your brain go super fast. I like to think of stimulants as you are slamming your accelerator and you've ripped your brake out. This is the equivalent of what a stimulant would do to your brain. You can't shut down until the substance has left your body. Then you have what we call a stimulant crash, which is if you rip the brakes out of a car, what's the only way to stop your car? You crash it. That's the only way to stop your car. So your body does the same sort of thing. Um, you're going to see rapid heartbeat, increased respiration. You might have a, a risk of heart attack because your heart beats very fast to keep up with the energy of your body, or you could have a seizure uh, as a result of that. Next up are hallucinogens. Hallucinogens are things that people part, they, these tend to be like party drugs, uh, is where you tend to see them. So LSD, uh, ecstasy, MDMA, psilocybin, uh, peyote, these sort of things alter your perception and make you see and experience weird things. Uh, a lot of people will like uh, pop LSD and then go watch a movie or they'll go outside and watch fireworks and they'll just be like mesmerized by it. Um, these things tend to cause increased body temperature, sweating. And the biggest risk here are, is uh, psychosis. Psychosis would be where you are experiencing psychotic symptoms of seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, and experiencing, touching things that don't exist. You're hallucinating these things. So a major side effect of this is similar to what we see in like schizophrenia, uh, which are psychotic symptoms. And the psychotic symptoms persist as long as the drug is in your system. When the drug is out of your system, the psychotic symptoms go away. Uh, marijuana is probably the most famous of the hallucinogens. We're gonna talk about marijuana in a bit, but that's usually where it fits in that category. Next up are dissociatives. Dissociatives uh, cause a detachment from reality. The most famous dissociative is a date rape drug in which when you slip someone a date rape drug, it's almost as if they knock out. They have no perception of what happened during that time. It's almost like their memory is wiped from that moment. This is what we call a dissociation. Um, you have PCP, ketamine, there's a bunch of them. Uh, that caused this. Uh, and usually, like it says, you have disorientation, speech difficulties, anxiety, and memory issues from a dissociative uh, drug. Next up is opioids. Opioids are your heroin, fentanyl, Vicodin, codeine, painkillers, all of this stuff fits under opiates. And this stuff can relieve pain. Everyone knows what an opiate is and what an opiate does. It's a painkiller. That's its major primary purpose. Uh, the side effect of this is it causes drowniness, insomnia, 
Uh, it can collapse your veins. What it can do, most importantly, is it shuts down breathing. The side effect of taking an opiate is that it slows the breathing down. If you take too much of an opiate, it shuts the breathing down entirely. And usually, someone who overdoses on opiates dies in their sleep as a result. We're going to talk about opiate overdose in just a sec, but I want you guys to keep that in mind as a major side effect. And the last one is inhalants. Inhalants are things that people inhale. It's literally what it's called. You inhale it and you get high off the inhalation. So paint thinners, uh, gasoline, whippets. I know that in adolescence, they tend to take like those dry erase markers and they sniff markers, um, which I did as a kid too. I'm not addicted to it, but I did it as a kid because it does smell weird. Um, but too much and excess use of it, especially if you use paint thinners or whippets, usually causes brain damage. It actually kills the nerves in the brain when you have too much uh, inhalant use. So that's a major irreversible side effect uh, of that. Uh, so I'm going to talk just, I'm only picking three or four of them. I think I'm going to focus on four of these. The first one's going to be alcohol. This one's very obvious, which is, hey, Muslims don't drink alcohol. It's haram for a reason. This is why. And the reason why is because it causes severe effects to your body. Everything you can imagine, alcohol will affect your brain. Uh, it can cause uh, bleeding from your esophagus and your stomach, uh, affects your lungs with breathing difficulties, causes liver damage. It destroys your liver. Uh, as a result, it can uh, affect your heart, affects your muscles, pancreas, everything. All, all of it gets affected. And that's nothing to say of the effect of alcohol itself as an intoxicant, causing you to become drunk and disoriented and disinhibited. You don't tend to be yourself. A lot of people call it liquid courage because you say and do things that you normally would not do when you're sober, but you do it when you're drunk. It's like alcohol takes away your inhibition. Um, so in this particular case, I think as a community, we should be really frank with ourselves that there are plenty of Muslims and a lot of Muslims that I know who struggle with this. Alcohol is their vice. And even if it isn't their addiction, there's regular consumption of it. It's not seen as an issue or a problem. But as a community, we have to engage in a conversation that is more than just this is haram. It's not good enough to just say this is haram. You actually have to engage people where they're at with what they're doing. And you can take this from the example of the Sunnah itself because the Sahaba, before the prohibition of alcohol itself, the Sahaba did consume. The Sahaba did drink. And there was a harm reduction approach in which it wasn't cold turkey. It was first quarantining it by saying there are certain areas you cannot drink. That's the first step. And the second step was then controlling behavior. And then the third step after that was no more anymore. You can see that in the Sunnah itself, it's a stepwise process to getting someone to stop. It's not, as, it's not as easy as simply telling someone, no, 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 haram, don't do, and then poof, addiction's gone. It doesn't work that way. No human being works that way. It doesn't work. It has to be a slow process. A brother who drinks a gallon of alcohol a day versus a brother who drinks a can of beer, I would prefer the brother who drinks a can of beer. And if I can get that brother drinking a gallon to slowly wean his way down to a can this is progress. This is progress. The eventual goal, of course, being to no longer use it anymore. But this requires sabr on behalf of the family, the person, and the treating provider. That we are slowly weaning someone off. Cold turkeying sounds great in concept, doesn't work very well in person. There's a very high chance of relapsing once you cut someone off of something. They're going to have very strong cravings and they're going to have withdrawals. In the case of alcohol, unlike the other substances, you can die from alcohol withdrawal. You could kill someone if they're an excessive drinker and you suddenly cut their alcohol. They can suffer from something that we call a delirium tremens or they can suffer from alcohol withdrawal seizures and die from it. So it's important to make sure that we slowly wean someone off. The general consensus usually for stopping an addiction is to cut back, then from cutting back, minimize, from minimizing, stopping. That's the general route that we tend to go uh, for that. Uh, next up is nicotine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways uh, that us as Muslims consume uh, nicotine. This is something that you don't even have to go very far. Just literally drive a couple miles into the city and you'll just see a ton of Muslims out in the street smoking. It's just a normal thing we do. Heck, go back home and you'll see every single Muslim smoking. It's just a very common thing. Nicotine is very, very extensively used in our Muslim ummah. And on top of that, it's actually normalized. It's seen as like a normal, typical thing to smoke this, because it's not seen as explicitly haram. It's not. Therefore, it's seen as like a normal thing. And the most important thing now is that in youth, there used to be a big push to uh, just say no and truth.org. 
uh, and it worked for a little bit. And then we had the advent of the e-cigarette. We had the advent of Juul uh, and vape. And this has now caused an explosion in the use of nicotine um, amongst our youth. And this becomes a problem. So we start up top with regular cigarettes. Uh, you tend to get around one milligram to about two milligrams uh, per individual cigarette, which means if you multiply it, you get about 22 to 36 milligrams of nicotine in a pack of cigarettes. If you smoke hookah, one, one hour session of smoking hookah is equivalent to smoking an entire pack of cigarettes in one go. Anyone who tells you that, no, dude, it's totally good, it's just fruit flavored, I don't want to hear that. It, it just doesn't jive with me. I mean, you know why you're smoking, you know what you're doing, you know what it's for, and you know what keeps you coming back, you know. Uh, next up is going to be Juul, or an e-cigarette. Uh, the way this is measured, we measure it in terms of um, cartridges, where, I don't know how to describe it to you guys. It's almost like um, a flash drive. If you guys have seen a flash drive, where you like uncap it, and then you smoke it, and then you cap it back. And inside this small little flash drive is in a, a liquid form uh, of nicotine that gets aerosolized. It, it gets turned into a vapor, a mist, and then they inhale the mist from there. And in order to replenish the fluid, it's in a cartridge. You remove the cartridge that's empty, stick a new cartridge in. One cartridge tends to be uh, about a pack of cigarettes. An entire pack of cigarettes are 200 puffs um, of a vape. Uh, next up are mini cigars and pipes. You get not too much. You got 3.8 milligrams per cigar or 5.2 per pipe. I don't know any Muslims who smoke by a pipe. Uh, it's a very old. If you yeah, if you guys are into like Sigmund Freud kind of looks and you want to like look very like professorish, okay. Uh, I don't really see that. Um, but this is important for you guys to know. I just want to focus particularly on cigarettes, hookah, and uh, e-cigarettes in particular. I wish there were more youth here because like that's what they need to hear. Because hookah is such a problem now. And they swear by hookah that it's a social thing. I have mango flavor. This one's watermelon. This one's whatever. And then for Juul, Juul also has mango flavor. Juul also has strawberry vanilla. Juul has like cinnamon, cinnamon toast crunch, whatever. <laughs> There's all these different flavors of nicotine. And the point of all of this is it's not even about the fruit flavor. It's about the marketing. As long as you can make this look hip and cool, then a lot of people are gonna use it. It's the same thing. It's just a different generation, different substance, same concept. It doesn't change with that. But if your Muslim community does not talk about this, then I guarantee you, the minute a group of youth leave the masjid, that's the first thing they do. We had this problem uh, two months ago, uh, where I had a group of youth during a Q&A session in Ramadan uh, tell me that uh, they have strong nicotine withdrawals. And they said that it gets really, really bad right before Maghrib time. And that's when as soon as the Adhan hits and they break their fast, they have to take a hit. And in my head, I'm thinking to myself, you guys are 15 years old. And you're telling me you have nicotine withdrawals before Maghrib time. And you're 15 doing this. If I gave you another 10 years or if I gave you another 20 years, how healthy are you going to be to fast at that age? If this is how strong your cravings have become. 200 puffs sounds like a lot of puffs. A typical person who smokes a jewel very often can usually go through 200 puffs in about half a week. They can go through that. That's a, ha that's a pack of cigarettes in half a week. Two cigarette packs a week. That's an insane amount of nicotine that someone can smoke. But just because it's in the form of a jewel, it doesn't feel the same as individual cigarettes where you can see yourself running low on something. It's way more addictive because you cannot see the addiction. It's in a cartridge that is invisible inside. It's sinister, the way that these kind of things work. Um, so after uh, nicotine, I want to talk about everybody's favorite drug. This is what everyone's going to ask about. Every Q&A, this is always what I get asked. Dr. Sharif, I smoke. Is this halal? Because it really helps me with like my anxiety. And I'm thinking to myself, OK, did you try therapy? No. <laughs> But this really hits the spot. And I'm like, that's fantastic. You know, honestly, uh, other people who have difficulty with their depression, cocaine can really help you with your depression. Why not make an argument for that? You know, it's because there are evidence-based treatments for things. And for this, there isn't too much evidence when it comes to this. And oftentimes, uh, what I always tell people is don't, don't throw numbers and data at me. What you should be giving me is your NIA. That's the most important thing because that's what it basically comes down to, which is why are you even using this to begin with? Is it really truly medicinal or are you using it recreationally? And if you're using it recreationally, are you masking your recreational use with a medicinal reason to justify your use of it, which is pretty common. 
uh, to do that. Uh, if you have a doctor prescribing a medicinal dose of this, which is supervised, totally different story. I got no problem with that because it's supervised by a clinician. You have someone who's giving you a dose and it's regulated and it's controlled versus you going yourself and saying, well, I have no idea. I'm just going to smoke like seven milligrams of this stuff. Well, what is seven milligrams? How often are you using it? When are you using it? What's the concentration of this? What form are you using it? And there's a thousand different questions I can ask that you don't have an answer to. You're just using it because it makes you feel good. If you're using it because you make you feel good. That's not exactly the right reason for using this. That's not medicinal then. You're using this recreationally at that point. Um, so just to give you a brief crash course on this, we have cannabis. Cannabis has two species, two different types of cannabis plants. The first one is hemp, and the second one is marijuana. They're different. They're like sister plants. Uh, all of this is shaitan's lettuce, but they're two sister plants that we have here. We have hemp and marijuana. Hemp is high in CBD. Marijuana is high in THC. What is this? There's random letters? No, they're different. THC is a psychoactive component of marijuana. What I mean by psychoactive is all the nasty stuff you see as a result of smoking marijuana, all the bad side effects, the people going wild, ripping their shirts off, like running in the street naked, uh, becoming really paranoid, locking themselves and barricading themselves in the room because they feel the CIA and FBI are coming after them, uh, red bloodshot eyes, uh, being super down and out. Uh, that is all THC because it's psychoactive. It actually affects your brain chemistry. The other version of it, so when you take this plant and you break the plant apart, you get these two separate things. Hemp gives you CBD, and marijuana gives you THC. Hemp for CBD, cannabidiol, this is not psychoactive. It doesn't cause that. You don't get the psychosis, you don't get the paranoia, you don't get all those other effects. You get the other effect, which is the more Hollywood effect of marijuana, which is you have someone take a drag and they're like, bro, you ever figure that like, you pay for a zoo, but you're paying for something that they stole from somewhere else. So why are you paying for a zoo if the animals are stolen? This is what is CBD. CBD is the whole down and out, slow, relaxing. So naturally, of course, if you want to market this to people, you obviously don't want a bunch of people running naked and being paranoid on the street. So instead of giving THC, what you give is CBD. CBD is what is used in everything and everywhere. Whatever someone can put CBD into, they have put CBD into and marketed it to you guys. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. There is CBD everything. Head to Manhattan, New York City, you literally see a gyro cart truck with CBD. They give out edibles. That's what they do. This is legal. CBD is legal. THC is what is illegal. This is what is important to understand. So when someone tells you I'm smoking marijuana, I have no idea what that means. What are you smoking? What is it? How are you using it? In what way are you using it? If you look up on the screen, you have topical creams with CBD. You have raw cannabis that you can eat or you can smoke. You have infused beverages. It's inside drinks. You can use it in a spray. I have never heard of someone sticking it where the sun don't shine, but apparently you can stick it where the sun don't shine as a suppository. Most people vaporize it and use it as vape. Uh, you can also see it as patches in food or smoking a bomb, uh, or taking a split. There are many different routes by which you can consume marijuana. The important thing that I wanna emphasize when it comes to marijuana is, and this is super important, is that I understand that this is all the rage and I understand that it's becoming legalized. This is the next big thing happening. All I can tell you is that as a doctor, as a psychiatrist, just because something is legal, does not mean it's safe for you to consume and it's safe for you to go nuts with. It does not. Alcohol is legal and drunk drivers kill thousands of people. So I cannot simply say just because something's legal, hey, it's A-OK, -okay, man, don't worry about it, it's all Gucci. It's absolutely not. And just because CBD is not psychoactive does not mean that it's ripe for you to use however much of it that you want. You can still have side effects from CBD use. So do keep this in mind for yourselves. And keep this in mind that if someone makes an argument to you about this, really it comes down to intention for use. That's what the conversation comes down to for marijuana. If someone needs it medicinally, for example, glaucoma or for a seizure disorder, there are medicinal uses for CBD that we would prescribe in pill form we give to someone. Uh, I have done it once. And the one patient I did it for was because seizure medications did not work. They had an allergy to seizure medications. They could not get treatment for their seizures. And this is the only alternative that I could come up with. 
this is where CBD oils come into play. And only then, I've never used it in any other case over here. So do keep this in mind for yourselves that THC is the thing you wanna avoid. The last thing I wanna touch upon for marijuana is something called synthetic marijuana. It's like laboratory made marijuana. The, the biggest culprit is K2. K2 is also known as spice. K2 is a synthetic marijuana in that it takes tons of THC and very little CBD and it's incredibly psychoactive. K2 is something where usually if someone takes a head of K2, often what we see is they come to the psychiatric ER in handcuffs because usually they're going crazy or they're going wild. They're very psychotic, they're hallucinating, they're paranoid, they often assault people or they break things or they run around naked. Usually this is what K2 results in. So uh, synthetic marijuana, I would say, is probably the most dangerous form of marijuana, uh, unlike organic. Uh, marijuana. I'm not saying that you should go smoke organic marijuana because it's better. All I'm saying is avoid all of it, but especially avoid synthetic marijuana, K2. Especially avoid that. Um, so I think I went through this. These are the immediate and long-term effects uh, of marijuana. Uh, you can take your look through this. I mean, the ones that we all know about is like bloodshot eyes, dry mouth and nose, psychosis, anxiety, paranoia, loss of coordination, feeling relaxed or drowsy. Long-term excessive use can often lead to a more permanent paranoia and a more permanent psychosis. Uh, and in some cases, I have seen cases where uh, someone has a latent schizophrenia inside them and from excessive cannabis use, they then get fully diagnosed with schizophrenia, which means even when they put marijuana down, they are still psychotic. It's a permanent psychosis that results from long-term excessive use. Um, so this is what we've seen. There's not enough data to support how bad this is yet. We don't know. But if enough kids keep smoking it, I'm sure we'll have enough data in a few years. And I can change the presentation for you to let you know what actually happens. Um, I'm going to shift gears and just touch on the last one, which is going to be opiates. Uh, opiates, everyone knows about. It causes a whole host of side effects. But everyone loves opiates because you guys and I pop Tylenol and ibuprofen like they're Tic Tacs. Because whenever you're feeling down or out, whenever you're feeling like terrible, whenever uh, you might have a cramp or you might have a headache, that's your go-to. It's Tylenol, it's ibuprofen, these are painkillers. The more stronger version of these medications are opiates, and in opiates, you can usually have a lot of difficulties with sleep, difficulties with developing a physical dependence. You might have uh, accidental overdose. Remember what I said, that it shuts down your breathing, slows your breathing when you use too much of it. You can have constipation uh, as a result, and it can also lower your bone density. You can have uh, very easy fractures uh, as a result. But the most important thing to focus on uh, for this is that the biggest epidemic that is running through this nation right now is the opioid epidemic. And this is a problem that we have because unlike the crack ep epidemic that only affected people of color, the opiate epidemic is affecting white people. And as a result, there's now a national emergency because of that. And just because we think, oh, it's just those white people that are into this stuff, absolutely not as a Muslim ummah, we are not immune from this. There are plenty of Muslims that struggle. And I know that you would think to yourself, well, I don't know anyone who shoots up heroin and comes to the masjid, unheard of. I can tell you for sure there are plenty of Muslims that take more painkillers than they're supposed to. And they do feel the buzz and the high from it. And they function normally thinking everything's fine when what they're doing is slowly over time developing a substance addiction. And for me, I work at Nassau University Medical Center. It's down in East Meadow, which is like 15, 20 minutes away from here. Uh, and I've had, I'd say over the course of my four years there, maybe 30 to 40 Muslims get admitted to our ER uh, status post overdose on opiates, usually from painkillers or from heroin use. Uh, and the most shocking thing was that we had, I don't know the exact number, I'd say maybe like six or seven uh, hijabis uh, that were in the detox unit. Uh, because for them, when you wear long sleeves, you could hide the needle injection uh, track marks on your arm. It's actually easier for a sister to abuse than it is for a brother to abuse uh, as a result. Um, so we had quite a few uh, Muslims in the detox unit. And that's why for me, it's eye-opening because this is not an invisible problem. I am literally seeing them dying in the hospital when they come. This is a problem our community needs to face. It's an ugly reality, but it's a reality nevertheless. And if you look at the screen, I have three different types of opiates here on the screen for you. The first one is one everyone knows about. It is heroin. And what you're seeing up on the screen is the lethal dose, the dose needed to kill yourself, the dose needed to die from overdose. That's how much heroin it takes 
to overdose and die. This is how much fentanyl it takes to overdose and die. And just that one speck and crumb over there of carfentanil, that's how much you need to take to die from that. These are increasingly potent uh, uh, formulations of the same opiate. So you go from heroin to fentanyl. Fentanyl is a much stronger version of heroin. And you cannot tell the difference. This looks like salt or sugar to you. You can't tell the difference at all. So if you're selling this uh, from someone, like if someone's selling this on the street and they're telling you, I'm giving you a bag of heroin, you have no idea if it's actually heroin or not. Do you have a homegrown lab where you can test the purity of what you're doing? No, you do not. You simply assume that what you're being sold is heroin when it could be laced with fentanyl or carfentanil. You cannot tell the difference. I could sell you marijuana and in the marijuana, lace it with this. And you wouldn't know. You have no clue, no idea. Which is why I'm a big proponent that if this is such a strong addiction for you, a doctor should supervise it. It should be prescribed. It should be dispensed. It should be controlled. That way, it's easier for us to keep track of it. But when it's like this from the street, I have no idea what you're using or how you're using it. And this is why a lot of people think they're using heroin. And then after using heroin, they'll suddenly overdose and die, believing they used the right amount, but not knowing that it was laced with something even deadlier inside of it. This is where you get accidental overdoses from. We've had a few cases in Brooklyn, um, in the Muslim community in Bay, um, Bay Ridge, where we've had a few cases like this, where we've had a few youth use opiates and then misjudge the amount that they're using, and this has caused an overdose. And it's a painful janaza to attend when you go there and you see the pain in the community there from having a child overdose on opiates and die. And a Muslim community that cannot come to grips with the fact that this is what is happening in our Muslim community. If enough Muslims die, then it becomes a problem. But if only one or two here and there die, well, then it's just a bad family. It's just a bad kid. It's just a bad situation. Or low iman. There's a number of different ways we can wipe it away and pretend like it's not our problem uh, for that. So signs of an opiate overdose, super important. You could save someone's life with this information, so do keep this in mind. If you have someone who is breathing very slow, very shallow breathing, almost like they're struggling to breathe, and they're unconscious. If you see that they cannot be woken up, no matter how many times you shake them, they're not waking up. Uh, if you notice that their pupils are very, very tiny, small little pupils, like pinpoint pupils, and if you notice their lips are blue, these are usually signs that they are deoxygenated. They're losing oxygen and they're going to die. So what do you do? First and foremost, call 911, immediately call 911. Get an ambulance to wherever that person is now. Second thing you do is you can use CPR if you're trained in CPR. If you're not trained in CPR, then the second thing is to use this, which is naloxone. Naloxone is a, a rescue medication. So what you're seeing over there, it's almost like they, they pinch it and then a, a puff, a spray comes out. If you take a puff up the nose, it reverses the effect of the opiate and it rescues the person from an overdose. You can save someone's life with using uh, Narcan. Narcan is something that you can get for free. New York State actually distributes it for free. You can go to any pharmacy, Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS. You can pick up a Narcan kit. It's very easy to use. If you want to get trained in it, I have a link at the end of this presentation and I can give it out to you guys. You click the link, you get an online training and boom, there, you have it. It's better to have it than to not have it. It's better to assume that you can help save someone's life than to wonder what you're supposed to do and wait for the ambulance to arrive and God forbid if something happens between the time you find them and when the ambulance arrives. So this is why I always, always suggest to, in each household to have at least one Narcan rescue kit. Allahu alam, you never know when you may need this. You never know when you may need this to save someone's life. Um, all right, then, anyways, this is what I was talking about. That New York State provides this free to everybody. Uh, so there's no excuse to not have one. Uh, we're going to finish up with this, which is how do you actually treat? I told you guys about all these problems. What do we do about all these problems? There's a number of different options that are available. There's inpatient rehab. Inpatient rehab is where you go inside of a hospital and you get a substance addiction treatment program where you work with a therapist, you work with a counselor, you work in a unit where everyone together is working on their addiction and it's considered to be a sober unit, meaning no substances, no drugs are allowed. And you can stay there for 30, 60 or 90 days, depending on your insurance. Next up is a detox unit. Detox is different from rehab. Rehab is when you are already sober and you're looking to stay sober. Detox is when you are intoxicated. You have the drug in your body and you need to get it out. This is where you go to an ER and you request detox services. And they can detox you from whatever it is you have inside you. If you have uh, opiates, if you have alcohol, if you have benzos, you have marijuana, methamphetamine, whatever it may be. 
they'll provide detox services. So think of detox as acute right now, get the drug out of my system, and rehab as I want to stay clean, and I don't want the drug in my system anymore. Next up is professional counseling. There are a lot of different counselors and therapists that can help you with this. This is something Sister Sadia touched upon earlier, which is psychotherapy is very, very critical in helping someone through their addiction. It is something that I always will recommend whenever you're struggling with addiction. You must have a therapist and a counselor to help you work through your cravings and work through whatever it is that made you use to begin with and help stop you from repeating these behaviors. And last but not least is dual diagnosis treatment, which is if you have a substance addiction and you also have anxiety or depression or bipolar or OCD or whatever it is that you have, you can get treatment for both together in a dual diagnosis program. There are a lot of clinics that offer that kind of service if you really need that. So this gives you a time frame for how this works. So detox services, usually three to five days. It takes one week to detox someone off of uh, alcohol or to detox them off opiates. Uh, if you want to stabilize them in rehab, it's two weeks or longer. It tends to be around a month, month and a half, two months-ish. Depends. Uh, then you have residential treatment at halfway houses and sober homes. This is if you have someone who in the midst of their addiction, they are harming your family or they're stealing from your family or there's criminal behavior that you cannot have in your home. You fear for the safety of your family. This is where you can opt for a residential treatment service or a sober home and you can have them recover outside of your house and then come back to you once they've achieved a long-term sobriety. So these are options that families have in case there's a lot of conflict with substance use, which oftentimes there usually is between families. Uh, and then the last one is outpatient services, which is just regular clinic. Just following up once a month to make sure that you are staying sober. And that's the goal that we have in mind for most patients that suffer. So I wanna give a really special shout out to this organization, uh, Milati Islami. The link is right up on the screen, milatiislami.org. I attended one of their sessions. Milati Islami has specialized in a 12-step addiction recovery program that takes the Alcohols, Alcoholics Anonymous program and adapts it for the Muslim community. So it's an Islamically integrated 12-step addiction recovery program, which is organized and run by Muslims who are former addicts and know how to help someone through an addiction. I, uh, I attended two of their sessions during the pandemic. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal service. And I strongly recommend if you have friends or family members who are sober and are struggling or who are in the midst of their addiction, strongly recommend connecting them to Malati Islami services and having them join in on some of their sessions. Uh, the first link up there is uh, nasada.org, N-A-S-S-A-U-D-A.org. Uh, this website lists every single detox, rehab, and substance treatment program in Nassau County, all of them. So if you need a quick lookup for where your nearest detox or rehab is, or where to go for inpatient rehab services, or any outpatient clinic services, that's the link to go to. That link, you put in your zip code, wherever you guys are at around the area, and it'll show you which clinic and which hospital is nearest to you for substance treatment services. And the last link on the bottom, that's for your free naloxone kit training, where when you complete the training online, they'll ship you and mail you your own naloxone rescue kit uh, if need be. So that's the last link uh, on the bottom there. You can snap a picture of this if you want. I know it sucks to have this weird, long, big hyperlink and for you to literally type it in. I'm sorry. I'll see you inshallah if maybe Mufti Farhan can like email you guys uh, all these things afterwards. Um, and then uh, this is something I really wanted to point out, which is uh, Nissa Helpline, which is based in Canada, actually had this during the pandemic, which is a sisters only addiction recovery program support group, safe space for sisters with alcohol and addiction problems. I have never in my life seen something like this. And it took Canadian Muslims to show us that this is how you're supposed to do it. And I don't know if this service is still active. I'm not sure. I, I have never joined it myself because I'm not allowed to. But what I would say is if you have an interest in joining a sister's addiction group or running a sister's addiction group or want to connect a sister to sister's recovery program, there's the numbers on the bottom and both emails, support at Nisa Helpline and addictions at muslimcarecenter.ca. I know they're based in Canada. I get it. But we're in the virtual world. It's all Zoom now. You can attend this virtually. So I do want to give this uh, link out for any sisters who are interested in addiction services. And then this particular book is gonna be my final recommendation, which is Overcoming Addiction, An Islamic Approach to Recovery. This is written by two brothers, both brothers who were incarcerated for substance possession, and they are both formerly recovering addicts. 
from multiple substances. So it was poly substance use, poly substance addiction. They were arrested, incarcerated. After they got out, that's when they started to write. One brother got out of jail and helped to co-author the book. The other brother from within jail authored the second half of this book. It is a phenomenal book. This is probably the best book I've read on a substance addiction recovery from an Islamic perspective from Muslims who they themselves have suffered through addiction and have overcome it. So if you have anyone that you feel will benefit from this, this guy is on Amazon. I think it's like seven bucks or eight bucks uh, on Amazon. Well worth it to have this. So that being said, I think I went like way over time. I'm super sorry for that, Gareth. My apologies. Uh, but you guys are feel free to email me or uh, message me. You can also follow me on TikTok, which I do not have an account for. But if I did, you totally could. Um, but it's a pleasure. So Jazakum and thank you guys so much for listening to this long, huge professor lecture. So thank you.